I love storytelling, and I think about storytelling a lot. And thankfully, it's my job to do storytelling. Because of those things, I have a lot of conversations about storytelling, and sometimes they go like this. This game can have more story. Eh, we don't have room for more writing, and nobody really reads writing. Or, um, how are you going to deliver the narrative in your game? Well, we don't have budget for cutscenes, so we're not really thinking about that. Or, um, you know, oh, pull in our narrative design team early so we can get you thinking about that. Yeah, we'll pull you guys in later when we start to think about story. And these things aren't bad, but it did make me start to think, clearly there is a disconnect between what I think about when I think storytelling and what some other people think about for storytelling. Hence this talk, everything but the writing, narrative design for theming, vision, and environmental storytelling. But this talk is not just to clear up those misconceptions. This is a talk of joy because, guys, we work in video games, which, in my opinion, which I know is exaggerated, but I do feel this way, it is the greatest storytelling mechanism that we have invented so far as humans. We have all of this constantly evolving technology that allows people to experience amazing emotions in different ways. We have all these different collaborators in art and tech and production and design and storytelling, uh, again, delivering it in all these different styles. Uh, and we have the audience who changes the story and who becomes a collaborator with us in the art we do. And collaborative art is the greatest thing. So I'm so excited about the potential for storytelling. And my hope from this talk is that you come away with a couple ideas of uh, how you can make the most of this great potential of what we have in our awesome, awesome medium. Um, me. All right. I'm a design manager at PickPock, which means that I do help uh, oversee our design team, but I also oversee the narrative side of it, which is everything from that high level, what is the world, what is the vision, what is the IP and tone of this, to the low level, actually doing the narrative design and doing the writing, and everything in between. Uh, I have a degree in film from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, there's the Capitol building in the snow. Uh, obviously, I'm American. I'm sure you can tell by my enthusiasm and enunciation and general volume. Um, having that background in film was a really great way to, to learn about storytelling and the different options there. Uh, from there, I went to work for Epic. Not that Epic, sorry. Not the Fortnite Epic, but Epic, the electronic medical records company, which is now the world's <laughs> yeah, a lot less exciting, but the world's largest provider of electronic medical records where I founded their e-learning program. So I, I learned a lot about instructional design, which helped me understand interactive design, and again, storytelling and reaching an audience and UX and things like that. And we went from, in the six years I was there, not having e-learning to having e-learning lessons that were watched by 200,000 healthcare professionals every single day. Um, side note, because my voice was in almost all of them as the narrator, it was really easy to get consulting work. Because <laughs> like every hospital in America had heard my voice. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know you. We'll work with you. <laughs> Which I know that kind of self-promotion is not a Kiwi thing, but it works. <laughs> I almost worked an apology early into my presentation to be a little more Kiwi, but it, it didn't come off sincerely. I'm sorry. <laughs> From there, I went to work in uh, educational games uh, where we taught physics uh, through this story, uh, very narrative-driven game. So we had this story where like, these evil people had kidnapped scientists um, so they could control all knowledge. And you had to travel back in time and learn the science from the scientists and then use that science to solve problems. Uh, so it was very cool. But it was a startup and, and went away after a while, uh, as they do. Um, and then I was a teacher for a while. This is me with a bunch of my students at uh, SACE, which is a world-renowned creative youth development program in the States, uh, where we build leaders through art. Uh, and I taught game design and multimedia. Throughout all this time, I was also an indie artist, including eventually full-time just doing uh, working art and indie art, where I did a lot of weird things, like this which was a live action Street Fighter in front of an LED wall where we choreographed a whole like fight story in front of the animations um, to create a live action video game. Or this, which was a poetry generating robot where we took 300 years of San Antonio poetry and built it into a computer kiosk so every time you pushed a button you got a unique poem created dynamically from local poetry. Uh, or this, which was my attempt at a panto back in the States where I worked with an Indian dance troupe to create uh, a Bollywood-style panto uh, with Indian music and constant audience interactivity. Uh, or this, which is my choose-your-own-adventure Sherlock Holmes play with 24 different paths throughout the play where uh, the main villain was the audience because Holmes had to do what the audience wanted him to do instead of what he, the world's greatest detective, wanted to do. 
uh, this, which is my indie game, Heroes Must Die, which is a deconstruction of like hero and villain tropes. And this, which is the stage version of Heroes Must Die, where we actually had the audience interact with the show like a game and had like puppet monsters and giant video game sets and the course of the show would change based on what audiences decided. Which is to say, I do a lot of weird storytelling, which is what I want to share with you guys today. A couple of uh, thoughts. Um, this is a lens from which to look at things, like Jesse Schell's awesome book of lenses. Meaning this is perspective, it's not prescriptive. You don't have to do all or even any of the things I'm going to talk about today, but hopefully um, by thinking about the same things that I think about, you'll get some new ideas. That's really my takeaway. If you can come up with one or two new ideas to bring into your own narrative design work, or have a better understanding of how to work with narrative designers, then I'll have done my job. Um, I also want to note that narrative design is very collaborative. I'm speaking as a narrative designer, but aspects of narrative design come from art direction, animators, artists, cinematics, level designers, production people, and so on. So I have my own perspective, but we have to remember that it's all collaborative. Uh, I'll be focusing on examples from Pickpock, so I can speak to them in detail, and there'll be plenty of time for Q&A at the end. But again, what I want you to get away is if you think about some of the things that I think about, maybe you could add some new aspects of narrative design to your work, or again, work with us better. Quick working definitions to help us out. Everything I'm talking about is storytelling, but when I refer to game writing, I mean literally that, actual dialogue, actual text, including the plot and character backgrounds you write beforehand. When I talk about narrative design, I'm talking about everything else that helps tell the story, the fiction and the fantasy and the fascia for alliteration, the connective tissue. Um, the stuff that makes all of the gameplay and art and everything else reflect the story and how the story underpins all those things. And you may have also heard terms like lore and world building and that's all wrapped in here uh, as well. The point being is narrative design allows us to do all of this stuff without necessarily having to do this stuff. And that is the thesis of the talk. Again, broken up into three areas, theming, vision, and environmental storytelling what I mean by those. Theming is the tone of the game, the mood. Uh, as our art director likes to say, the what and the why, but not the how. Um, before you write, you need to know the voice of your writing, the setting, the place, the feeling that that setting evokes, what your player's motivations are, and how our story can support those motivations. Having a strong understanding of the tone and narrative design can really help with that. Again, it's the connective tissue. How do all the game components actually feed into each other in a meaningful and cohesive way that reinforces that tone and mood that we want? That's theming. A couple of examples of games with strong themes. I've got the Dragon Quest series, which have this friendly fantasy, very black and white, good versus evil, um, kind of silly monsters, like high stakes but no real danger. That fairy tale fantasy runs through the entire series. Uh, Brutal Legend, great uh, example of the you know hard rock, hilarious metal theme run through that whole game. And that last one is Shadowrun Returns. The cyberpunk theming of Shadowrun Returns isn't just a visual pastiche. The characters, the backgrounds, the stories, the human themes that run through it, even the skills and combat that you have are all reinforced by this cyberpunk theme. Uh, so again, some examples here. The first pickpock one I want to talk about is uh, My Cat Club, which is in development. It's in soft launch right now. And this is a fun one to start with, because early on, this game did not have any story as most people think of it. There was no plot. There wasn't really any dialogue going on in the game. But again, there was still storytelling, because it still had a strong theme. The theme was you were moving to this new city and establishing a new life and uh, using it to raise your cats and just like have a chill time with cats in your new life. But how we had to get that across was in what that setting was. Like, where were we going? We put a lot of thought into what the city was. We talked about real world cities and came up with something like Seattle that has a vibrant arts community and is kind of hippie and hipster in a fun way and a little retro and is on the water, which you don't get in America as much. Great thing about New Zealand, everything's on the water. It's gorgeous. <laughs> So we thought hard about what kind of cities would evoke the feel that we want and what kind of places in those cities would reinforce the lifestyle that we want people to have. So even simple, subtle decisions like making sure we had a waterfront area, you know, with this cool old lighthouse and the crab shack there, like that evokes a certain type of charm or this idea that one of the districts was an arts festival. I mean, this very well could have been an industrial zone or a residential zone or zone two. But the fact that it's an arts festival shows that, oh, you're in a vibrant city, there's cool things going on, there's artists who live here, 
again, it's feeling that motivation and that overall theme we want of you're moving to a new city, you're starting a new life, this is a vibrant life with cool people and cool things happening. So even though there's no story associated with this in terms of writing and plot and dialogue, just deciding to make this one of the settings is reinforcing that theme. Um, so I'm going to show you some old stuff that was in the game before that isn't now, but we made a lot of decisions around the specific locations as well. We had to think about things like what currencies we were getting. You were getting coins and fish treats. And um, what places would make sense for a cat to actually go to? Because um, again, it's about raising cats and sending them out exploring. And again, where would you want to go? What has a cool, you know, vibrant, retro, hipster, fun feel? And so instead of like going to the bank to get coins, you go to the arcade um, or the fish market or the bookstore and this koi pond. They're all places that evoke, again, this feeling, this sort of nice, uh, rich, outdoors feeling, these, this friendliness of welcoming people there, the sense of cats looking at the world. And again, just by choosing these locations or others that could have made similar sense for the currencies, again, we're reinforcing that theme. Hopefully, just by looking at this, you kind of get a feel of, yeah, you get that hope of like, yeah, new life, cool places to go visit, cool people I'm going to meet, my cats are going to love it here. That's storytelling even though there's no plot uh, amidst that. Uh, as we did go to actually add on more story, um, and we evolved things a little bit, there's a photo mode that we're adding now, and um, you're taking pictures of your cats and your interior design, and it's really cool, and we're like, all right, what's the, how do we reinforce that theming? So now you're going to be these social media entrepreneurs. So even before we talked about the story, we just wanted to get the character right. Like we wanted a character who feels, you know, young and relaxed and cool and happy and enthusiastic. And just the facial expressions and animations of this character before we even know, you know, her background or the specifics of her story, again, are reinforcing that theme. Like you can see, like she's happy, she's excited, she's hopeful. Um, those kind of decisions, mostly brought about by our art and animation teams, are reinforcing the story. These are aspects of narrative design. Um, we also rolled the social media theming through all the mechanics. So you can see here, this is your experience bar. This is how you progress through the game, but it's not experience, it's followers. It's your popularity. It's the number of people who are following your site. So every action you take in the game gives you more followers, which reinforces that theme of you as a social media entrepreneur. And hopefully that theme fits in with the other themes you've heard about moving to a new city and starting a new life in a vibrant and fun way. So again, the little things by just how we branded the experience reinforces that. And we're carrying it through as well. Here's an early mock-up of um, your photo feed. So your profile is going to look like a social media photo feed, potentially, and you can see the photos you took. And again, we're just carrying through that theming through the game. Um, and none of it so far has been done with a specific plot line. Though we did decide eventually that we wanted a specific plot line. But before I even thought about what that plot is, I talked to the team and went, how are we going to deliver the story? So again, I just brainstorm like, OK, cool, we've got this social media theme. How do we carry that through the story? And we talked, for example, one thing we liked, and this is in progress, so we don't know where it'll actually happen, is we like this idea of Instagram stories. So the way we would tell the story is it'll pop up as if you were looking at the character's Instagram profile. So you get pictures, and there'd be a little text on them, and you get the stickers and animations. And again, that's reinforcing that social media theme. It allows us to express the character's personality just by like which and how many stickers they use and which font they choose says something about the characters, regardless of what the actual plot and writing is. And we really like that. Um, there's another idea here that I threw, like even just the scene, I was like, what if, what if we set the scene where you're doing the story like on a laptop and there's like a laptop on a chair and you zoom in, but before you actually get to the laptop where you see the story bits, one of your cats like walks across the keys and gets in your way and we have that there that happens sometimes, right? And that's a story moment. That's reinforcing the theme of this love with your cats and how they run through everything. But again, it's not a plot event. There's no writing associated with it. Um, so these are some of the ways that we thought about like all of the storytelling that can happen in my cats club without getting into again specific writing bits specific dialogue specific plot lines try and slow down my one weakness as a presenter is i do tend to talk a little fast great story-based game into the dead into the dead too some of our bread and butter at pickpock really great people worked on that early on in into the dead they had to figure out what their theme was and the thing I want to get across here is zombies is not a theme, right? That's a wrapper, but you really need to dig into it and go, 
it's not enough to say it's a zombie game. What kind of zombie game? What's the tone? What is the mood? What are our references? How brutal is it? How fantastical is it? How gory is it? Uh, and the team settled on this understanding that they wanted it to be more grounded. They wanted it to be more about vulnerability uh, versus power. They wanted the characters to be realistic. They wanted it to be about survival. They found some good references to get that across. They wanted to keep it to classic zombies. Um, and understanding that this is a grounded, realistic, realistic, you know, in terms of character motivations and characters' powers, um, game about vulnerability amidst classic zombies, that starts to narrow in on a real theme. Um, and having references can really help. Uh, we're working on another project currently um, related to Norse mythology, and we had to go through the same process. It's not enough to say Norse mythology. What's our take on it? What's our angle? What, what makes us different? So we looked at what was out there and trying to think about like what are our players' motivations, um, what other Norse games are out on the market, what do people like in those and don't like, how do we differentiate ourselves from that. So before we did any storytelling, we just went, what kind of Norse mythology are we? Including the decision to go, yeah, we're actually going to connect with some of the original material. It's great, it's hilarious and dark at the same time. And that's really fun that we can ping pong between like really dark and really funny. And it's epic on a grand scale of you know world eating monsters and things like that. We like that, we wanna stick with that. That literally, that's where our word epic comes from uh, is the Norse epics. Um, but we also wanted to lean into the humor a little bit more. So we're gonna look at Thor Ragnarok. Uh, not the visuals so much, and this was a combined exercise between AD and narrative. But again, this humor, the fact that the characters kind of don't take the situations too seriously, even though they're epic, that there is this sense of banter and the sense of camaraderie amongst the characters, even enemies. Um, but then we took it a step further and went, actually, you know what the battles are like? They're like sports. Like Ragnarok is like the Super Bowl of North Mytho Norse mythology. And uh, all these Vikings, like they just live and breathe battle, uh, which is also true to the source material. But we're just going to angle it a little bit more in that like unbridled enthusiasm um, and that kind of sports reference, which makes it a little lighter, a little funnier, gives us some metaphors to use in our humor and characters. And now we've honed in on a theme. Again, we went from Norse mythology to this specific like, you know, funny, epic, sportsman-like, you know, enthusiastic type of battle uh, that's different than the actual starting point. And then once you understand that too, your characters can help develop your theme even before you have your specific characters. We're going through this exercise right now in this project, but I'll take a step back to uh, Agent Intercept. Early on in Agent Intercept, which is our uh, action spy game, uh, if anyone saw Andrew Rouse's talk, uh, first one of the first talks at the conference, you'll have seen some bits from this. Um, we needed to establish the tone. We knew it was going to be an over-the-top kind of spy game, but before we wrote the specific characters and what their arcs and plot lines were, we started with character archetypes. You know, we wanted to have like your badass mysterious leader and you know, your nerdy research scientist type who's also a double agent. Yes, this is gonna be the type of game that has double agents. And you're like techno master megalomaniacal villain. And just by looking at these character types, we start to build the world and align the team on what fits this tone. So it's a subtle distinction here. Like these, this is art that made it into the final game. But at the point here, we weren't pitching specific characters. We were pitching archetypes that fit the theme and that helped us understand that the tone of our game, you can kind of see it in this art, it's a little bit self-aware, it's a genre pastiche, it's pretty over the top. It helped us realize that like, why stop at a double agent? We can make him a triple agent. Um, and again, these character archetypes helped us get there first. And then only later did we flesh out their backgrounds, their voice, their story arcs, start to subvert the tropes in the story, but we just started with these tropes. Um, so again, early on to understand these references really helps. And when making characters, we use things like, yeah, other media, uh, TV tropes, like I'll link to different TV trope sites so people understand that, um, and help us set the theme. Uh, this also helps with vision. So to define vision, it's the guiding force of a project. It's how you excite people, it's what people rally around, it's how you tell if what you're making fits your game, or if it doesn't. Um, and story can really help with that. Like narrative is a great way to build vision and get the team aligned. Some examples of games with good vision, uh, Dark Souls, it knows how hardcore it is. It wears that on its sleeve. It knows what players it's going for. Um, Breath of the Wild, it has a clear vision around exploration. Everything about the game, you get all the little secret treasure chests and whatnot from exploring. 
but you also, um, you know, they have weapon vulnerability, which wasn't a Zelda thing, but again, it encourages you to explore and find new weapons. Even the score became more ambient. Uh, and Star Wars Force Unleashed, I watched some early making of videos, and they had a vision, and it was kicking ass with the Force. And every day before the meetings at their stand-ups, they would be like, kicking ass on the Force on three. And everybody understood what the vision of that game was about. Um, one way we sold vision, uh, I'm going to show you some story here from Rival Stars Horse Racing. Um, I'm going to show you the intro video, which does have story and writing, but I want you to pay attention to the emotional beats of it, the parts um, that happen without writing, uh, and again, just like what you feel uh, as you watch it. Finishing on a high note. That's what the paper said of your grandfather's final victory. And it was well deserved. But I was there. I knew the reason he did it was for the thrill, the sport, and especially family. Your father was already comfortable in his own saddle and making a name for himself. But when your proud grandfather strolled on the stage, leaving him alone in the sun, oh, he took off like an untamed wind. But then, of course, You know how hard it was on the family. Right, I'm going to stop there. Um, so, yes, there is a story here. But the important part of the story is not just the plot that we're setting up. Again, it's the vision of a game. This is a game about the glory and the thrill of racing. This is a game about connecting to your family, family and reestablishing their legacy through this beautiful ranch that you're rebuilding and that fantasy of being a ranch owner. This story is about getting everybody who plays this game, giving them that promise. This is going to be a rags to riches story, which is the plot of a lot of horse racing movies. It's connecting to your audience. It gets the team aligned. This is a game about the glory of racing and the fantasy of owning a ranch and building it up into a world-class ranch. So while this is a cool story, it was also important in aligning our players in what this game is about and our team in what this game is about. Uh, and as we learned more that it was about the ranch fantasy, and our core audience actually liked that even better um, than the racing uh. stuff, we, we worked that into some of our features. So no narrative designer was involved in this, but it's great. Um, if you just sit on the home screen, the UI fades away, and you get to just spend time with your horses and the foals in there. And again, that's a strong vision for this game. Our audience loves their horses. So we're just going to let them spend time with their beautiful horses on their beautiful ranch and live that fantasy. Uh, Agent Intercept does a lot of vision through its story, so I'm going to show you a quick clip from one of the first levels of the game. So there's a helicopter, it fires a missile at a city. You have to turn around and do a ridiculous drift where you then transform into a boat uh, and take off. Now, yes, this is a plot line, like this is part of the plot of the level, but again, this clip is making promises to the player. It's saying you are going to fight ridiculous, awesome vehicle bosses. The world is going to be in danger. In level one, an entire city is at stake. Uh, and only you can solve it in your sweet-ass transforming spy vehicle. Again, it's not so much about the specific plot beats, but about the promise we're making through this. Um, and that kind of promise is something I used to align the team, too. This game was an early prototype when I joined. Um, but we just had a couple levels, and we needed to build out the campaign and the overall vision. And I remember, I'm like, I'm going to use story to tell the team what was possible. So uh, I had this thing. Oh, wait, I can clip through. I think I have it. I did. Um, this. So I came into the room, I was like dressed in a suit, I played this music, and I pitched them the whole game. I was like, all right, here's what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen in the next level, and then you're going to be driving on a rocket while that rocket is going into space. But that's not it. When we get to the end of the game, the villain has stolen the transformation technology and embedded it into the Earth itself, and the Earth is transforming around you. And... The point wasn't necessarily to get those specific plot lines across, but the point was to go, 
Look at what we can do with this game. Think about what's possible. Look at the type of experience we can deliver to our player. Let's get aligned on that. Let's get 100% on how far we can be and actually deliver moments like this. Two years of pitching and the rocket ride made it into the game. <laughs> And I'm very happy that this fucking ridiculous moment <laughs> is in the game. Certainly one of uh, the team's crowning achievements. But again, the point of pitching that was not to go, we need to have this plot point. The point was to go, this is the type of game we are. Let's own it. Let's lean into this 100% and make that type of game. Uh, but it isn't just the big stuff. It's the moment to moment stuff, too. So here's an example of some of the flow charts I use when I'm pitching a new missions. Um, so the idea is, at a high level, you can sort of see the beats. Um, you can see when there's cutscenes and uh, when there's gameplay. As you go up, the agent is winning, and as you go down, the player is losing, so we can kind of chart the path of it. I also use the size of them to be like, how big and exciting is it? So the idea is I'm like actually just pitching the flow of the story before we even get into the specific story beats. Um, and the things I think about when I'm doing flow charts like this is a uh, ludonarrative flow, right? That combination between gameplay, Ludo is the Latin word for games, uh, and the story. So I'm thinking things like, what assets do we have? And what are the key gameplay verbs? And what works for level designs? And how do I make a story that supports this? OK, we need a transformation sequence here. So the villain needs to do something to enable that transformation sequence. Or this level designer is really good at uh, high score things. So I need to make some routes that give them a lot of pickups. Or uh, we have a new weapon. So what's some cool gameplay that would allow you to show off this new weapon? So again, at a high level, before I get into the story beats, I'm going, look. Here's where we're going to use this asset. Here's where we're going to introduce this weapon. Here's how they all logically connect to each other. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. So in this level, you're chasing after the sub, which has a seismic super weapon, which, you know, again, fits our tone. Um, and you have to, like, get to um, a vantage so you can paint the target and airstrike it. Um, but then before you can get there, the sub fires off its weapon. And it causes an avalanche. And the avalanche comes crashing down and wipes out the boss that you're in the middle of fighting. Uh, there he is, you can kind of see the van get pushed away. And then you transform into a sled and head down to the sub. Again, that's, that's a dope moment, hopefully, when you're playing. But the goal of this, the vision here was, hey, we have this new Arctic environment. Let's get a reason to give you up in the mountains so we can show off that environment. Hey, we have this new transformation mode, the sled. Let's give there a logical reason for you to use the sled. So the idea is that everything is happening in the game is logically leading to the next thing. All of the art and gameplay elements are being driven logically by the story. So it's not just following the story, it's supporting the gameplay and the art. And that is the most important part of any of my Agent Intercept levels, is that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, the art, the bosses we have are all supported by the story in a logical and satisfying way. Uh, last point, and then I'll get us to questions, is environmental storytelling, right? So everything that happens um, without words in the background through the animation. Some great examples. Inside has a wonderful narrative. Uh, no dialogue, no words, all done through the backgrounds and the characters. Bioshock is great at all of this. In particular, I love that level in the first one where you have these corpses plastered up in these poses around this creepy art gallery, like so much storytelling in that. Um, here's a little moment from an old Castlevania game, Symphony of the Night, one of my favorites. Um, there's a little confessional in the corner of Dracula's castle that you're exploring. No words around it, no, no UI, but if you sit down, these ghosts appear and like act like they're confessing to you, and one of them eventually like freaks out and stabs you. Um, again, no words there, but it tells you how creepy Dracula's castle is. It shows you how elegant and graceful your protagonist is. Like It just creates this creepy surrealism uh, to this place and does a lot of storytelling. Uh, Into the Dead, really great with environmental storytelling. Here's a scene that I've ever seen. Planes flying through the background, dropping bombs, crashing in. What the hell? And then we see the results of that later. So you can see the craters in the ground. Very cool. It's not just the chaos. Not just the payoff of seeing those craters, but the planes flying themselves tell story. Oh, there's people alive other than me. The military is still out there. Are they helpful? Are they hurting? Dare I hope that there's a force out there can fight the zombies? Or are they bombing people? You start to ask these questions and build out the world just from that little scene of the planes flying by. Our clicker games are really excellent at environmental storytelling, too. This is from Dungeon Inc. 
uh, where you're building up this corporate office that has this sort of dungeony, monstery Halloween theme. Um, and again, the motivations of players in clicker games is just to gain more and more gold. And that is represented in all this background business where you're like using King Midas to turn things to gold or combing the golden hair, harvesting the golden apples. Like all of this world building is just happening with the little goblins in the background. Copy, copy, copy. Make sure they're flawless. they are bits of audio. Oh, man, this job sucks. Yeah, it's really hard. I could do a whole other talk on how uh, audio uh, storytelling as well, but I wanted to at least get a clip in there. So without, we do have a tutorial on this, but even if you didn't play the tutorial, if all you saw was this, like you wouldn't understand what's going on, you understand the world you're in and some of the characters you're in, like you see the goblins being taken advantage of and sometimes even dying in funny ways. Um, in there, I think there's a goblin covered in melted gold somewhere. Uh, and again, it's reinforcing that theme. And we do some really good environmental storytelling in Agent Intercept as well. Um, and this is a lot of credit to our design and animation team. So this is your scepter, your transforming spy car. These are specters, the evil versions of your car. We knew we wanted to have this new enemy that was like a twisted shadow of your own car. So how do we get that across? Well, you can see they have the same design, including even the transformation. But they have this creepy color palette. They're black with the shielding that makes them invulnerable, so they're really scary. Um, and in the way they move, your car is very graceful. It's always barrel rolling and drifting around corners, but their movements are kind of stilted. Like look at how it just jerks at you at this sharp angle. And while you have these nice slick guns, they have these big saw blades coming out of them. So it's like this, you know, painful version of your transformation technology. So just in the way they move, in their color palette, in the type of weapons they have, that tells you a story about what those vehicles are. And I'm gonna end on one of my favorite bits, heroic car, sad car. Um, we have a lot of these great endings where like you fly into frame. This is a great example of a classic heroic ending. Like you're, you're in plane mode, you seamlessly transform into a car, you compose in front of the camera, you have that little dip down and bounce back, which is a great little heroic move. And it tells you like, oh yeah, even though it's just a car, we never see people in the gameplay, they're just cars. Like you feel the graceful heroism and the cockiness of the car, uh, as opposed to something like this, the sad drive off, where it's very understated and they move kind of slowly and evenly. And I remember the storyboard uh, uh, artist Robin just saying, like, sad drive off in the storyboard. I was like, oh, I'm sure he could pull it off. And then I saw it and I'm like, oh, yeah, that is a sad drive off. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great, like, we tell so much character and emotion just the way those cars move in that little scene. Uh, so, so we have time for questions. Uh, if I can give you guys some takeaways here. It's that theming is storytelling, right? The tone, the mood, the feel, and the setting all contribute to a player's sense of the world, their goals, their motivations. It's the fantasy. But it's not just a rapper. Can't slap it on, consider it in detail. Can't just say we're doing Greek myth. What kind of myth? How do we represent the characters? How modern? How authentic? How anachronistic? Where are we subverting? What's our take? Story is direction. And I mean directing in all senses. It's cinematic directing, game direction, direction for the player to follow through the different levels, literally and metaphorically. And it's not just for games, it's direction for teams as well. Again, it's that vision of the direction that we're all working in to make a project that everyone understands and is aligned with. And in storytelling, all of this is collaborative. Again, it comes from artists and designers and more, and we get this incredible environmental storytelling that you saw through a variety of roles, all working together with clear theme and vision. And of course, the point of this whole talk, story isn't always words. Uh, writing is my first love. I love writing. It is my favorite thing. But we do not need it to tell good stories. Uh, and with that, I believe we have some time for discussions. So, thank you guys. Pete, you got the app. Pete's got the app. You can raise your hands. You can submit to the app. We'll look in there. I've left us hopefully a good 15 minutes. I don't actually know what time it is. But again, this is where the magic happens. Like lectures aren't really how you learn. Discussions are how you learn. Applying it to what you actually do. So let's talk. And if you're like boiling or too crowded and you want to exit, I will not be offended. Uh, so yeah, if anyone needs to walk out, do so. I won't call attention to you. Um, yeah, let's have some questions. So we got a question from the app um, from Nathan. Uh, at what point does perpetuating a themed character become reinforcing stereotypes? Ah, yeah, that is a really great question. Um, so it depends what your goals are, and you certainly want people to review it. I think starting from tropes is very powerful. A lot of people like just will not use tropes, because like, oh, I can't, I can't do what's already been done. They've seen it a million times. But it can be really useful. 
our spy game is a good example. We knew Agent Intercept was going to be super over the top, and we wanted it to push it as far as possible. So by starting with tropes, characters people recognized, uh, it was easy to just get them on board with the fiction. Um, but we did work to subvert those tropes, of course, uh, as well. So like our nerdy, you know, character was also very funny and very exuberant, and very outgoing. Um, and our like, you know, hard-ass leader character uh, actually had a lot of care for her people, you know, like Princess Leia did. Uh, but a good way to bring in is just ask other people, like, don't. Don't assume. Uh, there's some great people on the team that would catch me if I was accidentally falling into things. Like I'd be thinking sometimes story structure and dramatically and be like, oh, this character gets captured and you have to save them. And then someone would actually call out and be like, uh, how come the only character who gets captured is a girl? And I'm like, that is a very good point. Yeah, I was just thinking plot terms, but yeah, that was, that was totally a sexist trope. Let's change it. Um, so you have to get people to review it. Like, get people to check it out. Ideally, get authentic people to check it out. Um, we made sure to cast authentically, which is not always easy to do in New Zealand. Like, for example, I believe, like, hitting dozens and dozens of agency and hundreds and hundreds of people, we got two African-American women actually, like, applying for our African-American character. Fortunately, they were, even in the blind casting, the best choices, so it was good. But it's worth the authenticity. You need to have other people look at it. You need to have them review it. And just be open to it. Like, don't be precious about your shit. Change your writing. Iterate. It's going to change anyway. So if you get feedback from someone saying, hey, I identify with this, and this is a stereotype, go, cool, I'm sorry, let's work together to change that. Um, OK, we've got another question from Izzy. Uh, if wanting to blend or subvert genres instead of having uh, super nicely aligned themes, uh, how do you choose which parts are strongest to bring through? Great question. Yeah, a, a theme doesn't have to be one genre. A theme can definitely be a mashup. Hopefully some of the examples showed that, like the Norse mythology, I hope by showing that we brought that sports angle in, like I feel like that's definitely a mashup. You know, we have myth, but this, uh, you know, this old thing and this modern thing, this dark thing and this kind of silly thing. So your theme can absolutely be a mix of themes. Um, the difficulty there is communicating it. So having good and strong references is great. You know, again, it can be a mashup of references. So use references from other media. Don't just use video games, use movies, use books, you know, use music, use characters. Um, so if you're mashing up themes, that's great. And, and just be upfront with that. It's, you know, this meets this meets this. And here's specific examples of each. And you can even break it down. Like we can, you know, we decided, for example, that the sports theme, the sports aspect of the theme was not going to come through in the art. We wanted them to have very traditional Viking attire uh, and feel good that way, which is also a distinguishing factor because not a lot of things on the market had uh, accurate Viking things. They were just generic fantasy. So our direction team was like, the art is not going to reflect that. But the dialogue and the sort of character tropes are. So we have this um, traditional looking art with these more modern speaking characters um, and it married together pretty well. But we were very clear about where we were doing each and again we have these multiple references. So yeah, if you're mashing up themes and, and subverting things just be, use multiple references, use clear references from other media and just get on board of, of where each of the themes comes from. But a, a theme is definitely like a mashup of multiple themes for sure. Anonymous. Uh, how do you get people in other disciplines to care about your story? Yeah, great question. And I think the main reason I was hired at Pickpock, to the point where I sometimes have to tone it down a little bit, because uh, we're all we're all in this together and we're all trying to make good games. So uh, I would say the two main ways I get people in other disciplines to care about story. Sorry, I wasn't repeating the questions like you asked me to do earlier. Sorry about that, because we didn't have the mic. All right, so yes. How do you get other disciplines to <laughs> care about story? One is just be passionate. Like, I, I like to think I eventually win people over with just my own unbridled enthusiasm going, this is great, I love it, look at how happy it makes me, and like get other people in and see how happy it makes them, and just like getting everybody on board with being like, guys, we do cool work, let's get excited about it. Um, and authenticity goes a long way. Um, I think being vulnerable and showing your sincerity and authenticity is really disarming and really wonderful. So one, let your passion uh, shine through. But two, do the what's in it for them. Like I try to be very clear and go, look, here's our audience motivations. Here's what our spenders like. Here's what our core audience likes. Here's the mechanics that support that spending in our core audience. And here is a story that puts those mechanics front and center and puts those audience motivations front and center. So, you know, the level designers and monetization and live ops people should appreciate the story because I'm showing how it ties uh, to the money making process. The, um, the research team should get on board with the story because I'm going, hey, look at how it's hitting the audience motivations and the feedback we got from the user tests. Um, the artists get on board with it because we're collaborating. I'm you know, doing this stuff saying like, hey, you don't need me to tell the story. Like, 
that drawing you do is amazing. I'm going to change their personality to, to match that drawing. Or like, OK, what is our art scope? Cool, I'll work with that. And telling them, like, I want you guys to do this. Um, and then with tech, it's both. One, there is definitely respecting the constraints and going, yes, I'm pitching ridiculous stuff, but it's impossible. That's fine. But I think you'd be surprised how much tech actually really wants to do things. Like a lot of the kick-ass stuff in Agent Intercept come from our tech people going, fuck yeah, we can do that. <laughs> um, and bringing it forward and them being the champions of that. So if you show how, if you show your enthusiasm and if you show how what your story is doing is lifting up everybody else's part of the game and putting it forward, it should get them on board. Um, so now that all the questions we had through the app, so if anyone's got a live question, take it. Yeah, and I'll repeat it since we'll have them there. Yeah, I was just curious, um, what's more rewarding or successful or just ends up in a better result, starting with a character and building a story around them or sticking with the story and then trying to create supporting characters cool. that fit that? So question is, what's more successful or rewarding, starting with character and building story or starting story and building character? Um, the oversimplified but I think good answer is it depends on the game. And it depends on the vision of that game. Um, like Agent Intercept, um, you know, we knew was going to be a more plot heavy game because it was about the action. It was about the driving. It was about the mechanics. Um, and so it made more sense to have a plot that allowed for these mechanics. Um, and then the characters end up being really strongly woven in later. But like that was the type of game that was. Um, whereas in, say, our clicker games, um, Character collection is one of the key motivations and one of the key mechanics, so it makes sense to start with strong characters because there's only going to be so much of a plot because part of the point of clickers is that they're endless. You just keep replaying them. Um, but character collection, so those are going to be more character focused. You know, if you're making a you know, Night in the Woods type game, it's probably going to be more character focused. You know, if you're making a, a Assassin's Creed type game might be more plot focused as you're looking through these points in history. If you're making a Mass Effect type game, it's probably going to be you know a balance of both. So I think if you understand the game, the vision of the game, the motivations of the players playing that game, it should be clear uh, where the balance is. Uh, also, it's okay to change. It's okay to be like, here's a plot. Oh shit, that doesn't work. Or here's a plot. The plot is weaker, and the characters we came up with for that plot are better. So let's let's start building with that. Like you can change. You can go back and forth. It's all right. If one's not working out, pivot towards the other. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any opinions on uh, Lunar Narrative and Resonance and its relationship to like the points that I just made. Yeah, so talking about Lunar Narrative, Resonance, and Dissonance. I mean, uh, I touched on it a little bit when I was talking about how I, I built the flow of uh, the Agent Intercept levels. but. That should be the thing we're all striving for with story is ludonarrative cohesion or resonance. That is, the game, Ludo, again that Latin word, and the narrative, the story, are supporting each other. Uh, that's what, always what you should go for unless you're specifically subverting it. Uh, so again, that's what I, something I want to encourage you to think about is go, OK, like, if our game is about, uh, again, we'll use the Agent Intercept example that I had, right? It's like, OK, I need to introduce this weapon. I need to introduce this environment. I need to introduce this boss battle and this transformation mode. The story is going to support those. So the ludo narrative flow is the whole point of the story that I'm doing. And then after that, yeah, of course, I'm going to have cool character flavor and this great espionage plot, but it's there to support the gameplay. Um, and even things like, again, horse racing, like we're working on a new mode for that and to understand like, well, the gameplay is really about, again, racing and building up your ranch and spending chill time with these characters. And so it would be weird for me to like write a story that had this really high stakes plot where you were having to do all this action because that doesn't fit the gameplay. So trying to come up with characters um, who are interesting and, and deep and rewarding to get to know is part of it. Because the gameplay is just going to be you know, building up your ranch and doing some races and chatting with these characters. So uh, yeah, but it's about those character relationships. So I think, yeah, always uh, the great part about games, and whenever possible, the whole point of your story should be to support the gameplay. Which is not to say that it can't go the other way, right? If you have a more story-based game, again, you can sell a vision for a really great story, and then people can get on board and have the gameplay get that. But yeah, if your gameplay and story aren't talking to each other, then you're not doing good narrative design. Um, and if your gameplay and story are talking to each other, you're doing good narrative design. So yeah, I think, again, unless you're explicitly trying to subvert it, always go for ludonarrative narrative resonance, try and avoid the ludonarrative narrative dissonance. Um, and it's a balancing act that requires everybody to collaborate and a whole lot of iteration. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, oh, sorry, the question was, how do you provide story for games that have a weaker vision or found their vision um, later on? 
Uh, that is a, a difficult, super difficult thing, and it's something that's happened. It depends on the time. Sometimes you just have to go, you know what? Now's not the time to introduce story, especially if the game's really struggling and we realize actually an art change or a mechanics change or you know some other type of system change is going to be the better thing for the game. It's okay to say, you know what? For that project, it's more important to do that right now. Um, but in some ways, it's never too late. Cat's game is still in development. We're still finding more ways. Um, that's what I kind of talked you through, right? We started with just a setting and no story, but then eventually we realized, actually, yeah, with this new version, there is some story there. And again, the reason that works, and to tie it back to the question of how you get people on board, is it was very much me going, cool, team, I love your guys' new direction. The new mechanics you've worked out and the new progression systems are brilliant. Here's a story that I think can make those better. Um, and so it's, again, about how it can support the framework of the game. But again, maybe, if you're lucky, in the best case, that story becomes the vision. If the game's long and it doesn't have a vision, you come in and, be, and especially if you do your research, you understand the goals and the motivations and the strengths of the team and the, and the audience and all that, you can go, boom, here's a badass story that puts all those things you want up front. Maybe you can actually align the team. And they're like, oh yeah, shit, that makes sense. It starts to come together. And that can be the thing that brings the vision together. You know, it's hard to know when, when to come in hard. I'm still learning, especially in New Zealand, when I'm coming in too hard with that. Uh, but sometimes it can be just the right thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The question is about the connection between art direction and narrative. So first of all, that is going to depend on the company. Before I came to Pickpock, it was very much narrative driven, uh, partly because it, it was me like doing a lot of things. And I'm, that's like who I am. And it was very much like, here's the story. And then art came in um, and, and followed that. At Pickpock, previously, it was flipped. Art direction was very much like guiding it, and, and uh, the design was a little more technical, and the art direction was getting the story. And now we're at the place where it is very even. Like When we work together, we both come in right away and go, cool, let's talk, let's bounce ideas off each other. You know, Sometimes we'll separate, sometimes we'll come back. Again, I'll pitch a story thing, and they'll go, that's cool, and draw it, or they'll do a drawing, and I'll be like, oh, that's great, that gives me an idea. So one of the big successes we've had at Pickpock is making art direction and narrative work closely together and always include each other and, and, and build up that trust and, and uh, make that connection. Um, we have some, Tom in the back, give him a call. He's not on the art direction team, but he sits with them and does a lot of stuff. A lot of the great story stuff comes from just like Tom drawing stuff and me going like, oh, hell yeah, <laughs> like let me, let me build off that. But sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I'll write something and he'll animate it. And uh, yeah, I love going over to the concept team and seeing what they're working on and, and pitching them stuff, but also going, that's great, let me take that forward. Uh, and again, we got Mark here who's an animator, does a lot of great storytelling with his cinematics and animation. So uh, short version, depends on the team, depends on the project, depends on the company, but you'll probably have the most success if they're working together and have a good relationship of bouncing off each other. Do we have time? Do we have questions? Good, yeah. please fill it, guys. Especially like you were sweating, so let's make use of it. <laughs> um, I thought that uh, diagram was really cool where you had um, the one black disc to the balance disc speaking to your team at the time. Are there like um, other examples of different axes you used in these high level diagrams? Oh, yeah, good question. So, the question is about the flow charts and axes and how we get things across. Um, I think use the tool that works for the project. The reason that whole flow chart came about was because that's what the team needed. Like I was talking to the team about how to best deliver it and they were like, actually it would really help us early on if we kind of just understood the high beats and understood the, you know, the flow. And so I came up with that. Uh, other times, something bigger, like you know, Alexander Swords did a great talk uh, earlier about his high concept formula, but he also talked about the forest path. So if that bigger branch and forest paths works for you, like that's great, work with that. Sometimes a movie style script is perfectly fine, especially again if narrative is leaving it. Um, so there are a lot of different tools out there and rather than listing off a bunch of tools, what I'll say is like pick the tool for the project, again for the tone. Uh, don't feel like you have to use the same tool every time. Make new tools, change your tools in a way that works for the team um, and works for the project. Uh, uh, what, what process do you go through uh, when you're deciding what kind of narrative or theme to go through? Or what yeah, I can boil it down. So what process to go through for deciding the narrative and the themes? Um, the most important process that I go through and the most important takeaway I can give any game writer or narrative designer is the art of the shitty first draft. 
<laughs> just get something out there, get it in front of people, and iterate. Um, because your first idea is never going to be good anyway, and especially not in games. Because if your first idea is great, but the technology doesn't support it, or we don't have the art budget for it, or you know, the scope of the game changes, it's not going to come across. So I'm very much like, yes, there needs to be a certain amount of alignment, and, and you don't want to waste work, and you don't want to go off in weird directions. But I, I'm a big fan of just getting what information you need, slapping something down, being like, all right, here's what I'm thinking. OK, cool. This works. That doesn't work. This doesn't work. All right. Second draft. OK, oh, cool. You got that article. Okay, I'm going to change this. Oh, you got the project goals. They don't want OK, I'm going to change this. And just change, 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 iterate, 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 iterate. Like, Please do shitty first drafts and show them to people and collaborate with the team and iterate many times. Uh, I, I really think that's the best way. It also made me really happy because there was a recent interview in the New York Times with John Schwartzwalden, like the great uh, showrunner for The Simpsons, who'd never done interviews before. And that was his key takeaway, too. He was like, the best way to do a Simpsons episode was to write a bad first version of a Simpsons episode, and then eventually it would get good by rewriting and rewriting it and bouncing off the other writers and seeing what the animators do. And yeah. So I was happy to have that reinforced uh, by a legend in the industry. And Crystal, like, also, yeah, how do you, how do you iterate? Like, does it just the way that you were thinking of the scenes or, like, architecture? Ah, yes, good question. How do you iterate? A uh, lot of different processes. Sometimes it is uh, discussion. I get in a room, I pitch it, I get people's feedback, I write their notes on a whiteboard and make connection. Sometimes it's longer review. I send out a first draft skip, script, people read it, make comments, send it back. Sometimes it's in meetings. I come and I look at the art. I look at the tech. You know, I look at our you know, metrics, take notes, and go back and do it on my own. Sometimes I just step away from it and come back to it myself. Um, so all these different ways are good. Like, yeah, sometimes it's just me going away from it and coming back with fresh eyes. Uh, I think the key thing is, again, getting the, that feedback, whether that feedback is just you taking in information from the other teams and doing it, or actually giving it to people and going, hey. And also changes, like Agent Intercept is a good example. I'd start with that flowchart, then I'd do a more detailed flowchart, uh, then I would do the bones of a, uh, sorry, I'd start with the flowchart, get feedback from the team. Do a more detailed flowchart, give it back to the team. And there'd be sometimes three or four rounds of reviews where they go, actually that weapon's not gonna be ready, can you work in this other asset? You know, designer has a cool idea. Then I do the bones of a script just to be like, here are the points in more detail. That goes through several rounds of review with everybody on the team again. Um, then I'll do the full detailed script. That'll go out to a key part of the team, go through several rounds of review. And I even forgot, even before all that, I would always do a pitch session with the whole team that goes, here's the arc of the chapter. Again, just getting them excited and getting feedback from that. So yeah, in, in that game, for example, there were like four different deliverables that each went through several rounds of review, sometimes with the whole team, sometimes with key people working on it. So we've got about a minute left. We've got time for one more question, if you guys want to get one in. Otherwise, let's do this. I will be outside, I will be at tea, I will be at the after party. Please come find me. Networking is the best part of the conference. So I will see you guys later. Go cool off. <laughs>